way. <clears throat> so, uh, I know we really only got through chapter nine last time and we're supposed to go through chapter 25. It's not going to happen today. I'm sure I warned you guys about that. This is just a heavy chapter is why. Um, probably similarly heavy to like chapter six. I'm just, you know, telling you. Um, unless you've had physiology or unless you've already learned this in physiology. I don't think you guys have gone over metabolism yet in physiology. Have you? Anybody in physiology? No? You all know when I get into it, whether or not you learned it before. So uh, this is all going to be about mostly aerobic respiration. And we're going to talk about enzymes and how they function, how they're regulated, so we can get into aerobic respiration, which I keep telling you guys this about how you need to breathe and make ATP and all this. Now we're going to get into it. Okay. It is the day. It's one of my favorite chapters. Um, it is a lot though. I, I'm not, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. So um, anybody have any questions before we do get into it? Okay, I am changing policy. I'm gonna send out an announcement, but because I, I don't wanna say I'm excited, but I'm happy to do this for you guys, just because you guys know, I'm sure a lot of you have heard, and I'm just one of those really forgiving professors, and I tend to be that way. So me telling people who have missed lab, you don't get the points back, even though you wanna to try to do something to get the points back, it sucks. So if you miss lab, or if you have missed lab in the past, and I have told you, you can't get your points back if you missed it, if you had a verifiable excuse, either you have the proof and you can still send it to me or you sent it to me already, which most of you guys have, if you did. Um, if, if you're able to do that, show me why you missed, then I am going to let you guys get the points back. Now, I can't clear you of the absence. I just can't accept the rules. Um, you know, part of this course is you have to be there in person, hands on in the lab, not like over the screen. Otherwise the whole thing could be online, you know? so. Um, that's why you guys have, you know, I can't have to have a hybrid course, not just a total online course. So that's why um, I can't, you know, let you guys get over over five. So if you get to six, you know, it's an automatic failure. That's why. It's not my rule. That is the department's rule. So uh, if you hate it and you want to go complain to somebody, put on your angry face and try to go be angry with Dr. Rhodes. Good luck with it and <laughs> see how that goes because he's such a nice guy. He's so nice while he's telling you how wrong you are sometimes. So, uh, but yeah, he's he's the one. And then probably he would tell you to go talk to Dr. Bercala and he is not forgiving. So um, a lot of these policies came from him, but no, absolutely no makeup. He used to have no makeup whatsoever at all, ever, for any reason. I've had enough people who tell me about like their loved ones having died and they're going to a funeral and all of this, they'll send me, you know, pictures of like obituaries and stuff for their loved ones. And I'm like, it makes me feel bad that you have to do that. I understand how it is, you know, I get it, but um, I don't want it to be that way. So whether it's the chapter crap or the lab crap, if you've missed points because you weren't there, um, just uh, shoot me an email and I will tell you what you need to do to get those points. It's not hard. I'm not making you jump through like crazy hoops or something. You guys know those practice um, labs that I have on, yeah, on Canvas? Okay. They're not required or anything, but if you guys miss a lab, like let's say you miss the one that we're doing today, the uh, first day of Kirby Bauer with the pond water, then I would make you uh, do the appropriate a coordinating online lab for that. And that's where you will get your credit from. Not hard, right? You basically just click for it until you get a hundred out of hundred. So it is pretty easy. And, but at least it'll expose you to the material that you missed that day. That's the idea. Um, Cause they are pretty um, relevant. So that's the idea. If you guys do happen to miss a lab and you want to get the points back, at least that won't be weighing your grades down anymore. Okay. Or a chapter mm -hmm. activity. Um, I've been pretty lenient about those anyway. So usually I just send you guys a cahoot and if you do it, then Anyways, um, I just can't. It's like I can't sleep at night. I'll tell all the people no. Um, if you do the work, I think you deserve some credit. So let's get into chapter 10. Uh, again, metabolism. Metabolism, metabolism refers to all of the chemical reactions that are going on in the body. All of the chemical reactions in the body. It does not have to deal with your ability to burn fat or your ability to build muscle necessarily. It does those as well as literally everything else in your body. So let's not forget that it doesn't always have to deal with 
just weight loss or weight gain or stuff like how you you know deal with your carbs and whatever your macros it's not all that um so we can divide metabolism into two parts anabolism and catabolism anabolism i want you guys um you know whenever if you've ever heard of anabolic steroids right when somebody uses anabolic steroids and they're trying to build muscle more than like you probably would normally be building it naturally anabolic anabolism we're building we're making new bonds okay and any time that we're putting things together to build something new we have to put energy in right it's just like whenever we were taking the bouncing balls and putting them into back into our little uh area that takes energy I and mean, we're building something out of that so even if we're making new bonds right whereas catabolism is breaking bonds and i remember the difference if you can't remember from anabolic steroids and hopefully you can remember from cats because to me cats are destructive cats are going to tear things apart so that's how i remember that catabolism is breaking bonds or you know tearing apart molecules okay um, when you break bonds that releases energy so it really is the inverse of anabolism this is like what defines everything that we're about to get into in this chapter so <clears throat> and i'm going to talk a lot about um reactions being anabolic or catabolic um so it will help to kind of stay on track with that and i'll try to remind you about the terms as we go to uh, whatever we just said this so the whole idea all of this energy that's going to be made or used in any of these steps is going to be atp in the form of atp typically um so we have catalysts uh if you took chemistry then maybe you remember that a catalyst is anything that helps you overcome the activation energy in a reaction the energy that you need to make the reaction happen right to go from a to b products a you know uh, the reactants to the products right so enzymes are organic molecules that are catalysts that help you know the reactions in your body go really so anything in your metabolism is going to be uh, helped along by these enzymes that are catalysts for all the same thing just an uh, organic molecule um they're also pr pretty much uh pretty specific as far as how they bind with the molecule that they act on. So if you're trying to go with from your reactant A to like break it apart into, you know, B and C, your products, right? Um, that enzyme that acts on A to break it apart, it really is only going to interact with A um, or A-shaped things. Uh, so that's how important that um, the shape is, as well as, you know, whatever hydrophobic and hydrophilic crap is going on in that whole setup as well that often plays a big part of it. Because if you have a hydrophobic molecule and you're trying to fit into this pocket that has hydrophilic, you get the idea, it's not gonna work well. So they are gonna be basically designed for one another, or at least the enzyme designed to react with its substrate. And the substrate is it, what it's acting on. So our reactant or reactants here, okay? Or starting with our starting molecule. Uh, we do not use up our enzymes they uh, will be taking part in the reaction, but they're not gonna be permanently changed. So they can be uh, reverted back to the original and reused multiple times, which is great. It means we don't have to waste energy making new ones all the time. So that's, that's really good. Um, it says they're greatly affected by temperature and pH. That's the case for a lot of things, right? We know if anything depends on its shape as far as, um, the shape depends on hydrogen bonds, then it's going to be sensitive to heat and pH changes, right? And that's just like what we learned about with the DNA and breaking that apart. Just like with DNA, when we broke that apart with the heat, um, that was denaturing. It's the same thing for proteins, right? Denaturation. You break it down. Uh, we said this. Some structure. So you can have simple enzymes. It's just the pro one protein doing work. But we also can have conjugated enzymes. It's usually a conjugated enzyme is like the protein plus another thing that it needs in order to function. So the whole thing that functions and does all the work and it's all put together, that's called the holoenzyme. Mm -hmm. I like that because holo, you can just think of whole. I mean, put a W in front of it, but like you get the idea. The whole enzyme, the actual functioning portion. And then we have the apoenzyme. That's the protein part and the cofactor. Now, the cofactor is the part that it needs, that the apoenzyme needs in order to be able to function. Uh, this is as simple as something like hemoglobin. Hemoglobin isn't going to be able to carry oxygen through your blood 
if it doesn't have iron associated with it, right? So that is like a cofactor for that particular protein to be able to function. Um, so that's an example, right? That's a pretty straightforward one that we're all pretty familiar with. Um, any, anyways, cofactors, um, we can break that down into parts too. Organic or inorganic, just like we were doing in chapter nine, we had organic and inorganic, a lot of things. But um, organic molecules, we call those coenzymes. Um, and then we have inorganic molecules. Those are typically metal ions like we were just talking about with iron. And you can have both. You, have, you might need both. You might need more than one. Uh, it just depends. The place where your substrate is going to actually, you know, um, sit snug and, and tight and ready to do the whole reaction, that spot is called the active site. That's where everything's going to go down. It's a three-dimensional group uh, with specific amino acids to interact specifically with your substrate. Um, so each enzyme has different primary structure. You know, we kind of learned about proteins already, but just to reprise that, primary structure is your amino acid sequence. It's basically just amino acids, so alanine, proline, you know, whatever. Um, all the rest of them, phenylalanine, <laughs> whatever they are. Anyways, uh, glutamine. Uh, so those that's your primary structure. It's just like the ATCG in your DNA, okay? The secondary structure of the protein is going to be your alpha helices and your beta sheets. That's just those initial reactions between those amino acids right next to each other. And then those whole things can fold up um, and create their mess and interact with the whole protein together and um, even create covalent bonds through disulfide bonds, and whatever. And that's the tertiary structure, that polypeptide doing all that. That's one protein polypeptide. That might come together with other ones, same as it, or maybe slightly different. I don't even know. Like all sorts of stuff might have to come together to make a working functioning enzyme. And when that happens, that's the quaternary structure. Some of them might just work just like this, but a lot of them need more than one part to them. And that would be the total enzyme. So that is <laughs> getting into that active site, how all of this is folded, and how we'll have all these little grooves um, in here, potentially, that could interact with something and cause of that, help with that chemical reaction of whatever, catalyze, right? So this is just showing a picture that I feel like it's something really obvious, but here's your enzyme in purple, and our substrate is here. Clearly, this molecule, even though it has somewhat similar size and a little bit similar shape, it's not going to fit in the same pocket. So this guy will, it's going to bind in its little pocket. Usually that causes a change, just like binding to anything ever does. If you're associating with some molecules in this little pocket, it's going to cause the protein to adjust its shape just from chemical interactions. And that usually, usually is what can be used to drive um, the reaction as a catalyst, okay? So it binds and it starts doing its little work um, from binding and then now it's cleaved it into two parts and that's our products. So it's an example, a very basic example of how that would work. Metallic cofactors can include iron, copper, magnesium, manganese, zinc, cobalt, selenium, and there are others. Any of those trace elements that you've heard about in your diet, that's what we're talking about here. They're almost always going to be needed for enzymes. They're not used really for anything else. Um, so that's, yeah, you have so many enzymes, you have so many things that they could uh, need to interact with as a cofactor in order to function. Yeah, so oftentimes it says activate the enzymes. Once that uh, APO enzyme, right, the protein portion, interacts with the metal ion, it causes a shape change that allows it to be activated, allows it to interact with its target substrate, okay? Um, it can also bring the active site and the substrate closer together when they are interacting. And um, these guys can also uh, participate directly in the chemical reaction. The cofactor can participate directly and be used up, um, not the enzyme itself, though. But the cofactor, they're dispensable. Um, all right, other coenzymes. The coenzymes now, we're talking about the uh, organic versions of these. We have vitamins. Typically, vitamins are what I would be referring to if I get into talking about coenzymes. This is vitamins are an important component of coenzymes. They themselves can be coenzymes depending on the vitamin. But anyways, that's typically what I refer to when I get into talking about coenzymes is vitamins. Um, vitamin B, C, whatever it is, um, and interacting with something to help that happen. 
that's a coenzyme when they're organic molecules. Cool. So we have learned about how enzymes have parts that have to come together in order to function. The apoenzyme is the protein. We have the cofactor that might help it work if it's an organic molecule as a coenzyme. We have an active site as well. That's where the substrate, which the enzyme will be acting on to create the product, um, the substrate binds in the active site. And that's where the work is done. Cool, so there's uh, six classes of enzymes, four of them that I give a crap about, okay? I say you have to know all of them. I'm probably never going to test you on two of them. Okay? I'll tell you which ones, no worries. So we're gonna go down the list first. Oxidoreductases, these are enzymes that are uh, gonna be involved in usually electron ex exchange. If there's a hydrogen involved in the electron exchange, then that's dehydrogenases. They fall under that category though, okay? <laughs> so anytime we're moving around electrons, those enzymes involved, oxidoreductases. If that starts to sound like the reverse of maybe like redox, get ready. Because if you don't remember what a redox reaction is, I don't know how to help you there. But so we're going to get into it. Um, but transferases, moving one group to another. There is going to be a step in aerobic respiration that involves moving a phosphate group from one thing onto a DP to make it ATP. That's that's transferring, right? That's not anything crazy there. Um, when that happens, that's not the primary way we make ATP though. The primary way we make ATP is via this. Okay? And uh, it's gonna have something called the electron transport chain. So of course there's gonna be redox reactions like out the butt, like it's just a lot, okay? It's, the whole thing is driven by that, moving electrons around. Um, anyways. Then the next one, hydrolases, they're going to be breaking bonds. So breaking bonds, you're going to add water into that. So I don't know, there, I don't know. And then what are uh, uh, lyases, who cares? Double, I don't care about these. No, don't care. Double bonds, don't care. Isomerases should speak kind of for themselves. You guys remember what an isomer is? It's just a different shape of the same molecule, basically. Um, and these are enzymes that help achieve that. Um, I'm not ever going to ask about those though. Okay. All right. So those are the two that I don't care about because they don't apply to what we've been learning. The ligases, we know that that one is important. Remember how we talked about this with DNA ligase. That's important. So this is going to be forming bonds, formation of bonds, where um, we'll have input of ATP. So you're using ATP because you're forming bonds, right? Requires energy. And we're gonna be removing water. When I say removal of water, like it's a, like a waste product, basically. Whenever you join the bonds together, uh, water comes out as a waste product. So that's how ligases work. You can kind of see how they would be complementary to hydrolases here, yeah. Um, if you, when we get into talking about uh, biochemistry and biochemical testing for microbes, which is all that the second half of the semester is, so don't worry. It's not as bad as it sounds, I promise. But um, we will talk about like hydrolysis, you know, um, and how like there's an enzyme that can hydrolyze something, hydrolysis or hydrolyze, um, which takes starch and break it down into its carbohydrate components. That's called hydrolyzing the starch um, via hydrolysis with all hydrolases. The enzyme that achieves that, by the way, is called amylase, but it's a hydrolase. And there's a whole bunch of other ones too, but it's more common. We're going to learn more about those later on. So don't, you know, uh, shove them to the side too soon. All right. Uh, this is the first time we're going to mention redox reactions. I don't know why we mention it here and then jump around and then come back to it later, but whatever it is, what it is. So oxidoreductases, these enzymes that are involved in electron movement. Oxidation is loss of electrons and reduction is gain of electrons. So I remember it as Leo says Ger. And then the other one you can use is oil rig. Whatever one you like. But I learned Leo says Ger in my AP chemistry class and I've never forgotten it since then. So um so lose electrons oxidized. 
gain, you know, electrons reduced. So if we imagine a scenario where you had NaCl, which I know we've been talking about this one for a while now. We talked about ionic bonds and about uh, donating an electron to your partner, right? And that, that's what happens. And then you, in water, disperse into Na plus and Cl minus because that electron got moved over to chlorine and it's happier there. Cool, that's ionization. That's nice. So when we have NaCl and we have dissociation into the ions of Na plus and Cl minus, this is plus because it lost an electron. And this is negative because it gained an electron. Okay, so if this lost an electron, it has been oxidized. Leo, sa Leo says Gur, the Leo Gur thing tells us that. If anything, that. Okay, so uh, oil rig works the same way if you prefer that one. Oxidize is loss of electrons, and then reduction or reduced is gain of electrons, okay? Whatever works for you. I like Leo says Gert, though. I am not kidding when I tell you guys that whenever I were to sit down and like work through some issues of uh, like answering questions or even writing questions for you guys sometime and um, looking at the question and being like, okay, is this molecule reduced or is it oxidized? It's hard for me to just pull that out of my mind sometimes. So I'll have to write it down. I'm not joking about this. I'll have to write it down in order to remember which one is which. And that's okay. If you need to write down on your scratch paper or something when not during the test, do what you need to do, okay? Because I'll almost certainly ask you at least one question about this, okay? Uh, okay, so at the bottom here, so we've kind of learned about which ones are gonna be oxidized and which ones are gonna be reduced. Um, chlorine over here, chlorine gained its electrons, so it's reduced, just to be clear in case anybody's not following. Right. NAD, it says, and FAD are coenzyme carriers. We'll get to that, okay? <laughs> so, well, we have uh, different kinds of enzymes as far as they're, where they're used by the cells. Exoenzymes, we learned about that with the saprobes, right? They're going to be making enzymes that they exude from their cell to break things down, and the broken down things now they can absorb into the cell. Those were exoenzymes. They put them outside of the cell to do their job. If they are inside of the cell doing their job, those are endoenzymes, okay? And it says most enzymes of metabolic pathways are going to be involved inside of the cell. That should make sense because you need that's what you need the energy. Uh, we have uh, different ways to regulate our enzymes. I warned you that this was coming. So we have the constitutive and the regulated enzymes. Constitutive, they're always on, okay? That word in general just means it's like always happening. It's a normal, it's the norm. And then we have the regulated enzymes that are going to be turned on or off depending on the genes, right? This is kind of similar to what we were talking about with the operons with the bacteria. If you guys can recall that from chapter six, the operons um, where, you know, lactose came around and then we start making the genes to break it down. We don't always make it, right? So that was an induced example. So uh, this can happen in any kind of cells. Uh, it's just we don't have operons related to it. It's just our one gene or something. And it's just showing you the difference between constitutive and regulated enzymes in response to a substrate. Constitutive enzymes are always going to be the same amount in the cell, no matter what. You're not going to make more. You're not going to make less. It's just always the same amount. No change, no matter how much substrate you add or, or don't have. Regulated enzymes, however, you might have this, this tiny amount. We add a whole bunch of substrate and the cell will make more enzyme to accommodate that, right? So that's induced. Or we could have a whole bunch of enzyme that's always made all the time. And then uh, something happens where we no longer need it. The things are used up. And so, you know, then we will repress it. That was like if we're always making arginine, like an amino acid, making a ton of amino acid and the cell isn't needing anymore. And we had that buildup of the arginine and that gave a signal to stop making it. Um, that's an example of that happening. There's a couple of different ways you can achieve these things, but um, the idea is 
you either turn on for making more enzyme or you had a ton of enzyme and you turn it off when you don't need it. Okay. Anytime that you have something made by an organism, a million times I will say this, that helps it with its pathogenicity or causing disease in the host, then that is a virulence factor. Anything that helps with causing disease in the host is a virulence factor. A lot of these enzymes can act as toxins to us. That means they cause uh, tissue damage, problems um, leading to symptoms. Um, and some examples of these, streptokinase, streptolysin, elastase, I'm re reading this for a reason, collagenase, lipase, and penicillinase. Okay, I'm gonna circle these two just because they're easy to give as examples. Uh, we know what collagen is. Yeah, we've heard of the word anyways. What you may not know is that collagen is very important as part of your extracellular matrix to help maintain the structure of tissue and everything. It's all over everywhere. It's not just, you know, keeping your, your thighs from getting cellulite. It's, or, or getting wrinkles or any of that. It's in general important in um, the extracellular matrix and maintaining the tissue structure. So why would a bacteria want to break that down? Well, they want to break it down because it allows them to get deeper into your tissues because that's part of what keeps them from getting deeper into their tissues. Okay, So break that down so I can squeeze in between yourself and get even deeper to cause even more infection. And you might think, wow, that the, the bacteria that like produce that, they must be crazy bacteria. Um, strep is, does that. Strep makes that. A lot of bacteria make that, actually. So pretty crazy. And then penicillinase, that is a giveaway too. Obviously an enzyme that breaks down penicillin, that's an antibiotic resistance gene there. If you have the gene for penicillinase, you would be resistant to penicillin and oftentimes um, drugs that are very closely related to at the same time. So um, you can see where that would come from. Sometimes that could, would, could come in from like a plasmid um, and get transmitted that way. We know that about horizontal you know, transmission of that genes. All right, uh, we already mentioned denaturation, but again, just one more time, heat and temperature, heat and temperature, uh, heat and uh, pH, whether it's high pH or low pH can affect the hydrogen bonds in the structure and then cause structural um, change and inability of the protein to function anymore due to the distortion of the shape. Right. Metabolic pathways usually multi-step. Some of them are just like straight, like down the line. Other ones can be a cycle and reuse uh, parts of it, components of it. Kind of like we talked about with enzymes, but whole molecules can be done that way. Um, some examples that mean nothing to you probably yet, but that will in a moment. Um, here's a linear enzyme system. We have the um, glycolysis. That's the first step in aerobic respiration. And then we have a cyclical one in Krebs cycle. That is the second step in aerobic respiration. All right. And then we have some branch ones. It depends on if you're breaking bonds or making bonds. So divergent is this one here. We uh, have M to N and then we break N apart into O and P and whatever. Those can go on to do other things, right? But we broke bonds there. So that is catabolism. And then the other one, we're bringing things together to make something larger. We're making a bond, probably put in ATP to do that. That includes something like amino acid synthesis. That's anabolism, right? All right. All right. Some molecules can mimic the substrate on purpose. That's the idea of them. If they mimic the substrate and bind in the active site, the enzyme usually can't bind on it if it's not the true substrate. So bind there and it'll just sit there and it can't be acted on by the enzyme. So it can't be like changed and then kicked out. So it can inhibit the action of the enzyme by doing that. Blocking by binding at the active site instead of the substrate being able to do that, okay? That is called competitive inhibition. It's competitive because we're competing for the active site. The other one obviously is gonna be non-competitive inhibition. Go figure. So in this case, the substrate would still be binding at the active site, and that's not what's getting blocked by the inhibitor. What the inhibitor, or in this case, we call the inhibitor a regulator, will be doing is binding somewhere else on the protein. That causes a shape change in the protein, and now it doesn't have the active site available anymore from that. But it's not binding in the active site, right? It bound somewhere else. 
So it's not competitive because that's really referring to the active site, okay? So that usually, usually when we see that, that's whenever we see um, uh, feedback from a product that's being made. So we have too much of it and now it started to build up. The cell isn't using it anymore. And then when it gets a buildup, oh, it comes in, it binds, you know, the little enzymes legs are, are nice and straight and it comes and binds on the back of the knees and it squats down. When it squats down, that causes it to throw out or uh, be unable to catch, you know, it's a little substrate or whatever, how you want to look at it. But yeah, shape change, comes and binds, shape, changes its shape. I can't hold the remote anymore or whatever. Yeah, um, that's the idea. So that is feedback loop, competitive over here. Just pictures of literally what I was just talking about. Um, normal thing is this darker color um, and that would go this way. Yay, we bound in the happy active site and we made our products, cool. The competitive inhibit inhibitor has a similar shape but cannot be acted on. So it's gonna stick in that enzyme pretty solid and nothing's gonna happen. Um, it's just gonna block the enzyme from being used, okay? Non-competitive inhibition, normal route would be, uh, we have our guy, it comes bind in the active site. We go this way, it's bound in the active site and it makes this product, yellow nose. It looks like a nose to me, so I don't know. Yellow nose, we get enough yellow nose built up. We don't need to make any more yellow nose. So perhaps it binds at the uh, regulatory site or the allosteric site, it's the same thing. Um, and then causes a change in here. So now this can't bind and we won't be making it anymore. Okay, that's non-competitive. Okay, anytime you have enzyme repression, we're stopping synthesis in a pathway, repressing that pathway basically is what I'm talking about here, okay? Um, this typically, and usually this is gonna be repression of the entire pathway. That's why I'm not making clear, sorry. Um, enzyme synthesis repression is going to be dealing with stopping it at the genetic level, typically. So this is the example. We have our DNA, remember DNA transcription into RNA, RNA translation into protein. We have our protein, we're making our enzyme, cool. The enzyme binds with this little substrate to make its product. We get the product, uh, enough of it will come and bind onto the actual DNA. So now we can't go from DNA to RNA, it's just blocking that. So that's regulation at the genetic level, um, controlling enzyme synthesis. Um, via enzyme suppression at D the DNA level, okay? So it doesn't have to be controlling the enzyme itself. It can actually be controlling the genes. Just depends on what pathway you're on, okay? All right, induction. Uh, we're in inducing our enzymes. <laughs> I don't know what else to say. This is gonna be literally the opposite of what we were just looking at, okay? It works the same way, but instead of turning off a gene, it would be turning on a gene somehow, okay? All right, energy induction versus um, repression. Energy in the cells. All reactions, just like we're talking about anabolic and catabolic, all reactions in general, the chemical reactions themselves have to be exergonic or endergonic. And they go with um, their respective uh, terms. So exergonic, exo, that means out. So we're giving out, we're releasing energy. Release energy. If we're releasing energy, that's usually because we broke bonds that release energy. This tends to be catabolism. Catabolic reactions tend to be exergonic. If we have endergonic reactions, we have to add energy for that to happen. Um, and those endergonic reactions, oh, usually we're building something and that is anabolism. So that's how those would work hand in hand. And it is quite, I feel like, obvious when you think about everything that's going on in a cell all at once, that these can be tied together in all sorts of different ways, all sorts of different steps in the cell process, okay? Coming back to our redox reactions. Remember, our redox reactions are going to be happening in pairs. You always have the one that donated the electron and the one that accepted the electron. The electron isn't just going to disappear into the ether ever, okay? So it has to go somewhere. So that would be the acceptor. So oxidoreductases are enzymes that will be uh, having a role to play in all of this. Don't worry, I'm not gonna make you guys know too much about the chemical aspect of these, but our most important coenzyme carriers, 
coenzyme, right? So coenzyme, that means that they're going to be interacting with enzymes. Hey, guess which kind of enzymes? They're going to be uh, oxoreductases, different kinds of them. Um, but NAD and FAD are going to interact with those and then grab on to some electrons that are made from breaking some bonds and then hold on to those electrons and move them to the next step. Okay, so our important coenzyme carriers are going to be NAD and FAD. How this is going to work, we've already mentioned how this, uh, with NACL, I like this picture better, it's more clearly drawn than my writing, but you have uh, sodium. It's got this little lone electron here. It doesn't really like that. And this has seven over here in the chlorine. It wants eight. We already know that because chemistry, right? So this guy will give its electron to the chlorine. Um, and that means that uh, if it lost an electron, sodium lost the electron, it donated it, so it's oxidized Leo. And this one gained the electron, right? Gained electron reduced, okay? You see this crap going on over here? Oxidizing agents and reducing agents. Don't worry about it. It gets confusing if you have to worry about both sides of it, okay? So we're not going to. Just know Leo says GER or oil ring. That's all you gotta know, okay? Don't worry about, I'm not gonna ask you which one is the reducing agent because that's a whole other can of worms I don't need to get into. Nobody cares. I mean, maybe you care whenever you're like bleaching something you want to know if it's an oxidizing agent or something like that, but like, let's talk about it then. Okay, so NAD, this guy that I keep talking about, our coenzyme carrier, carrying electrons around. So it starts out as NAD+. What they'll do is hold on to this hydrogen here. This hydrogen here comes along with an electron. That's how the bond is made here. We know bonds are going to be sharing of electrons there. It's a covalent bond. So um, there, that hydrogen is associated with an electron, okay? So that's how it's carrying the electron. In its little reaction of obtaining that situation, we say that it is associated also with this proton because it will, it will be donating off its electron um, for the thing. But anyways, NAD, NADH will always be with H plus is my point. What is NADH? It is nicotinamide with or without the hydrogen, right? NAD is nicotinamide. I'm not gonna ask you that, but that is what it is, okay? Uh, this is what it looks like. I don't need you to recognize it, but there it is. Uh, but you can see here, we have this double bond, uh, just so you see it. Uh, and now we don't, and now that allows us to uh, bind with our hydrogen with the electron that's being shared with this bond here. And that will also give us uh, H plus. Protons. Protons, I keep talking to you guys about electrons and how everything's going to be powered by moving the electrons around. The electrons are going to be moved around. Everything is powered by that. But the biggest component of what's going to be powered by that is creating a proton gradient. So we need protons too. But luckily, they tend to come hand in hand in biological models. Okay. So redox reactions, we already kind of know what's going on here. And electron transfer. It's a whole point of kind of all of this. And we're shuttling our electrons around in the form of these NAD and FAD carriers. And they become NADH or FADH, okay? That's ours. Our system has that. If you were a plant, you would also have NADP, which becomes NADPH. Go figure, right? So that's how those will work. Um, but yeah, because I'm going to be talking about that. I'm going to be getting into the pathways of aerobic respiration here in just a moment. And I'm going to be talking about, okay, here's our electron uh, being carried by NAD. I need you guys to know what that is when we get to it. Okay, remember catabolic pathways, electrons will be removed as we're breaking the bonds. That's the whole point of what we're about to get into, okay? Aerobic metabolism, that whole thing relies on when we're moving those electrons. Like I said, those electrons don't, when we're done using them, don't just disappear into the ether. They have to go somewhere. So the thing that cleans up the electrons is going to be oxygen. Oxygen is going to be one that has uh, the hand in that. I'll talk about how in a moment. That's okay. But aerobic uses oxygen to deal with that. Okay. Anaerobic, obviously, and being no arrow. We've already kind of mentioned these terms. Uh, this is going to be not oxygen. That's really all I need you to know about it. Okay. Not oxygen. There's going to be nitrate, nitrite, and all sorts of crap. So don't care. I just want you to know it's not oxygen. Uh, ATP, we already know it's going to be adenine, the nitrogenous base. 
ribose is the sugar, not deoxyribose, okay? And then three phosphate groups. When we look at these phosphate groups, if we have one, two, and three, numbering from closest to this mess, adenosine, um, these guys here, this bond between them has the most strain of all the bonds in the whole setup because phosphates in general with all these oxygens going on and how the phosphorus molecules work, they're pushing against each other. They're pushing away like two south poles of magnets or, or north, north poles, I don't know what you like, but you get, you get the idea, they're gonna be pushing away from one another and they're only being held by this covalent bond. So whenever you sniff this bond, so to speak, we break that bond, we can harness the energy associated with that to power all sorts of things in the cell. Um, that's how ATP works for us. I know we talk about it, but just, I can't stress it enough. Um, so there's different ways we can uh, make ATP. There's three main ways that I want you to be aware of, okay? Substrate level phosphorylation. Remember how we were talking about transferases? We're gonna be transferring phosphate from one thing onto a DP to make it ATP, right? So I told you already that, that it's a thing that we can do. So it's one way to make ATP. Uh, we also can make ATP via oxidative phosphorylation. And if you're not already looking at oxidative and thinking like, uh, redox, then you should be. This is gonna be redox related reactions. So what does that mean? Electron movement. So we're moving electrons around. Oxidative, we're moving electrons around. So we're we'll using electrons and their charge and their interaction with proteins to, to uh, create ATP. We're literally going to be making bonds without putting actual energy into it. Like not the way that we typically would. If we use energy to do it, it defeats the whole purpose, right? The whole point is to make ATP. That's what aerobic respiration is. So oxidative phosphorylation is your big friend here, right? Photophosphorylation, if that doesn't say what it does, I, I don't know. Um, light gives energy to make ATP. Plants do that. Okay. Let's get into this. We're going to have three different ways that you can uh, make energy. Aerobic respiration, anaerobic respiration, and then fermentation. Remember how we mentioned fermentation and how that's done by facultative anaerobes, the ones that can switch between um, so we're going to get into how those work. It's the worst one of all of them. Um, the first step is glycolysis. And it's look, it just happens to turn out that all of them do this. All three pathways involve glycolysis. Okay. So here is aerobic respiration first, the big daddy. And we have glycolysis here. Uh, our product is going to go into the Krebs cycle. We're going to be making all sorts of electron carriers. These electron carriers are gonna go into something called the electron transport system. But because we're putting electrons in there, we have to deal with them afterwards. So we're gonna use oxygen as our electron acceptor at the end. But in this whole process, we'll be making ATP. Turns out aerobic respiration with one glucose molecule makes 36 to 38 ATPs. I can already tell you right now for the discrepancy here, uh, 36 to 38, humans, it'll be 36. Bacteria will be 38. Why would that be? Well, we've already talked about how we make our energy inside of mitochondria. We have to get the crap into mitochondria somehow, and that takes energy. So they're talking about net ATP here, like what actually is the yield here. So that's why they take away some of the ATP because we got to move stuff from the my to and from the mitochondria. That makes sense. Okay, the next one, anaerobic. So we already know this is no oxygen. I'm just going to give it away for you guys. It's the same, it's the exact same, except there's some other crap at the end, okay? That can lead to two to 36 ATPs, depending on the cycles that are going on, depending on the organism and all of this. You already see that our winner so far is gonna be aerobic respiration. Our next one is fermentation from our facultative anaerobes and some of the micro aerophiles. Fermentation, we basically are gonna do glycolysis and that's all. You see here how this says yields two ATP? That's the case for everybody in glycolysis, including fermentation. 
So what do we get from one whole entire six carbon glucose molecule that goes through fermentation? Two ATPs as opposed to 36 to 38. So that really puts it into perspective, I feel like, when you start learning about how this works. And um, of course, they don't have electron acceptors. They're still making NADH. So there's an electron here. We have to get rid of it somehow. So they use their own molecules as like their waste product from this to deal with that. Um, and that leads to manufacturing alcohols, acids, whatever it is that, that organism makes as a response, okay? There's all sorts of stuff, uh, but yeah. Fermentation, only glycolysis, it's a hot mess. All right, aerobic respiration, let's get into it. It's going to be enzyme catalyzed reactions and I'm not gonna make you name the elect, uh, I'm not going to make you name the enzymes, they all have names, believe me. Uh, I'm not going to make you know as much as I had to know about this. I had to know all the steps and all the answers. <laughs> I was a biochem major, so of course I had to, but I hate it. That's why I didn't stay with it, right? So um, that part I don't care about, but I think the concept is cool. So this is how all aerobic heterotrophs are going to do their business. So we're obviously that. We need oxygen and we're heterotrophs. We get our organic molecules from others. So... Um, this will give us ATP and also yield some intermediates we can use for other pathways, like making amino acids or nucleic acid or whatever it is, and shove those into other pathways, yeah? Because this can be used for more than one thing. Glucose is always our starting compound, so we're going to start uh, in the concept of all of this, okay? It's our, like, bread and butter of it, where we learn about all of this is via glucose. So here, important thing about glucose, it looks like it doesn't matter how many oxygen, OH, whatever, we all know how it kind of looks in general. It's this sort of hexagon sort of shape, and it's got uh, one, two, three, four, five, six carbons. Six carbons. We're going to follow every single carbon along the way. Okay. Ugh. So we're going to break a whole bunch of bonds and make ATP. That's the idea. Right. All right. Um, so in glycolysis, our first step, glucose will be converted into our product is pyruvic acid. Now, I'm not going to lie to you guys. That's all I really need you to know about this. Maybe the other waste products, be aware of them. But the number one purpose of glycolysis is to make pyruvic acid. That's the goal. The only thing it's trying to do is make pyruvic acid or pyruvate. They're really the same thing. Um, anyways, that's what you really need to know. We make a small amount of ATP. We already said we make about two net for this BS. Um, and it's also an intermediary metabolite as well. So if we want to use it that way, we can. All right, so this is glycolysis, guys. This is just glycolysis, okay? Um, if I was a total dick, I would have you guys go through every single step and talk about what's going on in each step and da, 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 like I had to learn, but I don't need you to know this. Okay. It's not useful for you. What is useful for you? We have our six carbon glucose up here. They just written it out in a little thing. So you can watch the carbons and where they're going. All right. Stretched out carbon, um, six carbons, six carbons. And there's a whole bunch of crap that happens. And then our product is two, three carbon molecules called pyruvic acid. Each one's pyruvic acid. Now, that's all you really need to know about it. But we also happen to have made in the middle of all this, this NADH molecule. Remember how I told you guys that's carrying electrons. That's really important for later, okay? I don't need you to necessarily know how many of these things are made along, but you should probably be aware when they're made, right? Like, so what I'm saying is like, uh, is if I write a question on the test that says, in, is NADH made in glycolysis? Then you should be able to tell me, yes, that's what I want you to know about it. Not how many or what step it, it exactly is. Going from glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate to diphosphoglyceric acid, what does that mean? Don't care, okay? Just know that, that we do make some NADH. That's important because we need electrons. We're going to go to electron transport chain with that. Uh, what else did we make? Well, see how we used some ATP up here? 
Um, so there's those. But we also made some ATP down here. So there's two, there's one, two made, one, two used, but we do this on two branches. So that is plus two ATP. So that's where those two come. Okay. What do you need to know about glycolysis? Six carbon glucose broken into two, three carbon pyruvic acids. We all, along the way, made two ATP and some NADH electrons. That's all. You're welcome. All right. Uh, what are we going to do next? What's going to happen next? We're going to go into the Krebs cycle. But pyruvic acid that we just made doesn't go into the Krebs cycle. Okay. No, no, no. This is pyruvic acid. We can use it for all sorts of things. It's hugely important for making parts of the cell or using it in fermentation or whatever. We can make fats. We can make sugars, amino acids with it, whatever. But we're trying to make ATP. Okay. We'll focus on that. So pyruvic acid, acid gets turned into acetyl-CoA. This is a two carbon molecule. We went from a three carbon molecule to a two carbon molecule. So what do you think is the waste product from this? Carbon dioxide. So this is our first carbon dioxide waste product that we'll make in the process, okay? Now I'm telling you here, this uh, two carbon molecule here, went from three to two, released some carbon dioxide off into the environment um, from that three carbon molecule, right? All of our carbons from our original glucose are going to eventually become CO2. Right? As we're breaking it down to that, we're stealing the electrons out of it. That's the whole point of all of this. Oh, uh, who cares? All right, there we go, let's see. Let's see, I don't miss something. So we have pyruvic acid. Getting turned into acetyl-CoA. All you really need to know about that is the two carbon. It's three carbon, got turned into a two carbon. Remember, always, don't, don't forget this. With one glucose molecule, we get two pyruvic acids, okay? Each one is gonna go through the Krebs cycle. Don't forget that there's another one there, okay? Anyways, I don't need you to know all the little steps here. I do need you to know during this intermediate step, we are releasing CO2. Pyruvate, acetyl-CoA, CO2 is the waste, okay? Now we can go into the Krebs cycle. So we're gonna go through it twice, one for each pyruvate slash acetyl-CoA, right? So we're gonna go through it twice. Uh, main point, the whole point of the Krebs cycle, I told you that the point of glycolysis was make pyruvic acid, right? Now I'm gonna tell you the Krebs cycle, the whole point that you need to care about with the Krebs cycle, we are making NADH and FADH2. That's the point, okay? We are cranking those out. Now they look in, not important to you because you don't know what they are. And this is probably the first time you've heard of them. Incredibly important. That is the whole point of the Krebs cycle. It really is the whole point of the Krebs cycle. I can't say it enough. It really is. You are going to make some ATP in this, two ATP for each pass through, I believe. Um, so you do make ATP in glycolysis, you make ATP in Krebs, you make a whole ton of them in the last step, which is going to be electron transporting. So um, there's three steps in case you didn't figure that out. So now that we have, uh, we're going to go through Krebs cycle. Now that we have our acetyl CoA, this is another one that you love, right? Uh, okay, so this is acetyl CoA right here. Uh, all like whatever. It's our two carbon thing. And you see this guy over here that you don't care what the name is it's called um, oxaloacetic acid, but it doesn't matter. But this guy who's already in the cycle, already was there before you got there, these guys come together to form and interact to form citric acid. Okay. So it's citric acid, and then we're gonna have that go through all of these steps. And it turns out through each of these steps, we can get something or get ready to get something. So over here, we're making NADH. We've also made CO2. Here we make NADH. We've also made CO2. Here we're getting some ATP. Here we're getting FADH2. Uh, we're putting water in there. NADH, electrons, right? NADH, CO2, right? There's our CO2. 
So here we have three CO2 molecules made here. And they will uh, be double for each go through. There's some carbon exchange going on here from the molecules that were already in the cycle. So that's how we can work the way that it does. But this is where obviously where most of our carbon dioxide will be made during this whole process, right? During aerobic respiration, most of your carbon dioxide comes from here, but your first one came from turning pyruvic acid into an acetyl-CoA, right? So you can think about it as all being related to Krebs if that works for you. But yeah, the whole point though, these. And you're gonna do it twice. So you can build up quite a few of them, okay? That's the point of this. Um, okay, so well, before we move on to the electron transport chain, I do just want to point out um, going from pyruvic acid to acetyl-CoA or any of these stupid steps in here where we're giving off carbon dioxide while we kick off car like carbons to take the electrons away, right? Um, that's where all of the carbon dioxide that you exhale comes from. 100% of it comes from this side stuff, okay? Plus the acetyl-CoA making thing. Um, yeah, all of it comes from here. So you can see that your carbon dioxide coming from here does not have the oxygen that you breathed in associated with it. We haven't even touched that yet. It's not the oxygen that you breathed in. Keep that in mind, different oxygen. But like a lot of people don't understand that. Okay, uh, electron transport chain. We're putting our stupid NADH and FADH finally to work. We collected all these electrons on these guys, and now we're going to do a whole bunch of redox reactions. Lucky, again, you guys don't have to know all the names of these things that's involved or the, the chemistry or anything. But essentially, we're going to move electrons from one redox molecule to the next. These molecules are called cytochromes, um, and basically they are going to be activated by the presence of the electrons. That's their whole purpose, too. But what happens whenever they get excited by the electrons? Well, let's say this is your lipid bilayer, right? That's your lipid bilayer. All right. So then the cytochromes. Oh, what the heck? That's from the left end. Cytochromes, they're going to be lined up as like they're proteins, and uh, protein like molecules have proteins in them, uh, lined up along this whole way. Okay, a few of them, and it doesn't matter how many. Don't have to worry about that. Okay, but the electrons that we get from NADH, that electron will associate with these guys. Okay, then move through, and as it is associated with these, and they are, you know, getting excited and changing their little shape in response. The proton that you have built up out here, because remember these come with protons, as well as if you get rid of this to get the electron, what are you left with? A proton. Yeah? So we have another proton. So we've got all these protons. So what happens is this, as it moves through, allows this to happen. You get hydrogen move, move through. whatever. So that's going to allow you to move all the hydrogen outside. Okay. So now you have all these protons building up. So those are all this. Okay. So we got a whole bunch of them getting just shoved out. Right. Number one, this process is called chemiosmosis. It's like osmosis, which is water diffusion, right? Except we're using not water, so it's chemical. <laughs> Let's just think of it that way. We're we'll using protons, you know, but still, it's chemiosmosis, what this is called, right? So we've got all these, um, and see how we are moving and creating this gradient of just like positive charge outside of the cell? That's against nature, right? That's against the gradient. It's like piling up those bouncy balls again, except we're not using energy. We're just using the interaction with the electrons. Okay, so it's an oxidative process. Oxidative because look, okay, so it's chemiosmosis. And this mess up here 
is called the, is the, what we're trying to make, the proton motive groups. Right? That's what we're trying to do. This is the goal. Right? So all of these positives getting put out here. So this will be largely positive out here. It'll be largely, relatively speaking, anyways, negative in here. Okay? So what happens now? What do these protons, by nature, want to do? They want to come back in. Yeah, they want to come back in for to equalize. So that's nature. That's what you need, right? So they want to come back in. So I wish I had another color that wasn't. I should know I'm in Dr. Scherer's class. Oh, yeah. Okay. So finally, we're going to get to. Let's just draw it like this. It doesn't really matter. This. This is a channel. Okay. And it wants those molecules to go into it. And as these pluses travel through this channel, well, it's pluses, they're H pluses, they're protons. We've talked about how that can affect a protein, right? Because of the interaction of those molecules um, affecting hydrogen bonds and all of this, that travels through, causes a chain in this protein, and that allows for a DP to be made into a TP, okay? That's how we drive that. So this right here, this is called a T P synthesis. Look at you, it speaks for itself as to what it does. So it's in that at the very end of our electron transport chain. Causes, uh, we've moved our electrons through, made our positively charged protons out here. They'll come back in through ATP synthase, and when they do that, it drives phosphorylation of ADP into ATP. That whole process of how we got to this ATP is called, we've already said it once, but I'll say it again, oxidative phosphorylation. Okay? So that's the whole process, like how that works. How we make ATP. And if I make a ton of it, we didn't use any energy to get there. We just used the power of the electron to move some proton and then have it come right back in. There's a problem already. Okay. Here's a problem. Now we've got hydrogen, these protons coming back inside, right? So what's happening? We're going to equalize again. We can't have it. Otherwise, this whole system shuts down. Okay? We have to keep these guys going out and create that gradient. This has to stay more positive. It has to. Otherwise, you don't make it. So what do we do as we build up all these guys that are coming back in? Well, that's where your good old friend oxygen comes in. Okay? Not only are we going to take care of these protons to maintain the positive out here and re relative negative inside, but we're going to take these electrons that are left. Like I said, they're still there. They didn't go into the ether. What are we doing with those? Those electrons, we're going to reabsorb them back into the hydrogen. Let's say that makes them H and H. No more pluses. We we'll take half of that O2. What's that? Water. If you do not breathe in, this cannot happen. This is the only reason why you die by suffering. Right there. That should put it into perspective how important this process is for your body. How quickly this can be skewed so it doesn't work when you die. You die from this. Suffocating is dying from this. Suffocating is not a whole separate thing. If this stops. No more ATP, you can't keep your cells moving and running. You can't keep your heart beating. That requires ATP, right? So that kind of put it in perspective of why this is so important in your physiology. Yeah. So for us, this is definitely clear, like, okay, you know, moving around and pumping your heart. 
Bacteria need their own energy for their own things. So they, they do this too when they're aerobic. When they're anaerobic, they just don't use oxygen. They use something else, whatever. And if they ferment, they don't ever get this far. They just do like all of this. And that's it. So that's why they only get this two Okay. Cool, right? I think it's cool. It's a lot, but I think it's cool. So here's some pictures of that stuff, but drawn a little bit better. And here they've included basically the pictures for anaerobic in the same place as the aerobic. Okay. I like mine better just because I can do it while I'm talking about it, like actually happening almost. But yeah, whatever. It's clearer for sure. So in our cells, this happens in the mitochondria um, on those little folds inside that we call cristae. Um, in bacteria, it happens on their outer membrane. That, I say this, their cytoplasmic membrane. I should say it that way. So the inner membrane. But um, yeah, here we have the gram positive cell, the thick peptidoglycan wall. And so they're just pumping those free ions, those protons, outside of that. Building the gradient there. We just do that in, in a contained space in the mitochondria. It's hot, y'all. Okay. Um, so we've already talked about ATP synthase and chemiosmosis and proton and whatever. Um, so the theoretical yield, it walks us through everything that's made and how much and whatever. And I don't need you to know that necessarily. I do want you to know that both glycolysis and um, Krebs make NADH. Know that. Those are important products. Yeah. Know that glycolysis, the important part of it is pyruvic acid. And that that's going to be made into acetyl-CoA, plus we're also giving off CO2, which is what this is right here, okay? So those are things you need to know for that part of it. Then we get into Krebs, NADH, and whatever, FADH2. That's our electron carriers. We're also making carbon dioxide here. Don't need you to know how many, don't care, okay? Just know that we make carbon dioxide there, as well as right before it. Then our little electron transport guys here, NADH and FADH2, drop their electrons off here, as well as their protons that will be resulting from them doing that, um, and shuttle them through the electron transport chain or electron transport system, whatever we want to call it, okay? Then you make ATP, yay. That's the point. I don't need you to know how many. Um, I would be aware that oxygen, when it's accepting that final electron, is making water as the product. I think that that's important to know that. Um, but anyways, I don't need to go over that rest of that. All right, so that's just that last step I was talking about, the H plus and the two electrons and half of an oxygen makes water. So I would know this, be aware of it, just how we got there. Uh, we already talked about anaerobic, we already talked about fermentation. This is an example of how the fermentation works. We, whatever, glucose through glycolysis, we make pyruvic acid. I like how they drew it this time. Anyways, there's our pyruvic acid product. Um, and as a result, during this, remember that in our, geez, how many? Okay, in our glycolysis, you make NADH. That's an electron carrier. That's an electron carrier. So that's a problem for our little old fermentation steps because what do they do with that electron? What are they gonna do with it? They can't, it's not productive for them to make a whole gradient of protons just for that one, right? So what they do is they drop it off onto some other molecules, usually our pyruvic acid um, uh, waste product. Somehow, whatever organism you are, you might make acid aldehyde, and that might even get converted into ethyl alcohol, or you might just go straight down into ethyl alcohol, um, or you might make lactic acid. There's other kinds of acids that you can make, whatever. Um, but yeah, so that's how they deal with that final electron that they have. Um, the homolactic fermentation is whenever you only make lactic acid, heterolactic fermentation, um, lactic acid, other stuff with it, <laughs> hetero different, right? Um, and then we have, these guys are mixed acid fermentation, which is different than the heterolactic, by the way, but this is a whole ton of different acids can made, be made. Okay. Not just a whole bunch of different stuff, a bunch of different acids. Turns out we have these um, enzymes called lipases that break down fats. Whenever they do that, we can get a six carbon fatty acid. Now I want to be clear about this. 
how many fixed carbon fatty acids do you guys know? They're usually like 15, but it's like 30 carbons, okay? Like the long chains that they have going on. They say like our um, unsaturated and saturated fats, right? So those are what I'm talking about. A six carbon one of those can yield 50 ATP if we put it into the right places in this whole system. 50. Um, I go like, uh, glucose only gave us 38 tops. 50. <laughs> so when I say this to you, I'm saying, man, those, those like fatty acids really hold on to that energy. They really store a lot of energy in there. That is why your body stores energy in the form of fat because it's gonna give you more yield in the end when it goes back to use it later, right? It's not as much yield to get energy out of protein in your body. You have to sometimes put energy in to get energy out of that. That's why keto, right? You know, that's how that works. Um, yeah, you can also do this with proteins. Cool. You can break them down and put them into the cycle. Amphibolism is just tying catabolic and anabolic pathways together and whatever sort of products that can go into whatever sort of reactions along the way. We need all of this in order to make cells, make you know phospholipid bilayers, proteins, whatever it is, you need either the energy or you need the intermediates. All that stuff is gonna play together. All right, moving on to photosynthesis. <sighs> I did better with you guys than I did the other class. I was like way over by the time I got to this. Okay, uh, aerobic respiration um, and photosynthesis. We have two steps in photosynthesis, all right? Number one, we have the light dependent reactions, right? Speak for themselves, you need light for this, okay? These are catabolic. They are going to make energy, all right? Um, and uh, that's great, right? So we have light, it's coming in and activating all these pigments along, theirs is quite similar to our electron transport chain here. So it's pigments that get excited by light and the light causes the energy that allows you to make ATP. Same kind of process though, but just instead of electrons, you have photons, okay? So we do that, we make some ATP, nice. You have to have light for that. The next one, light independent, you can do this in the light or in the dark, okay? But they say light independent doesn't need light for this part. Now, what are we doing? This is anabolic. We're gonna be synthesizing things. We're gonna use that ATP right here that we made from the light reaction in order to fix carbon dioxide into organic molecules. And specifically, what organic molecule? Specifically, glucose. So we're using light to make ATP through a very similar reaction as over there. We made a little bit of ATP. Then we're going to use that ATP to turn carbon dioxide from the atmosphere into glucose. And surprise, surprise, a lot of you guys probably don't know what the plant does with that glucose, aerobic respiration. No shit. Like really, that's how they get their energy. So they get this little amount from light, but they use it to make glucose to make it a big turnaround from just carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. This is like the part where I like look at people, it's like how much more cool are plants than us? Like they're still doing the same thing that we are, but they're just getting to that on their own. They don't need any help. They don't need to eat other animals for that. Forget it. So um, it's a similar process. It's pretty cool. Um, if you're interested in it, I'm not gonna ask you guys to know that, but I'm sure you know that the pigment involved in that primarily, the one that we know of and love, chlorophyll, right? So that's one of those pigments that will give off those. Um, that excited reaction um, and yield electrons from photons. So, whew, all right. Um, this is the Calvin cycle, which is that dark cycle or the uh, light independent cycle where we're going to be taking that ATP and turning it into glucose. I'm not, again, I'm not going to ask you guys to know this. And I don't need you to know anything else besides that, but there it is in case you're interested. Okay. Um, it's called the Calvin cycle. And that's how they make glucose. Then they'll go into um, making ATP via aerobic respiration. So in photosynthesis, you can be oxygenic, which obviously is going to mean making um, oxygen. And then we have anoxygenic, which I'm like, it exists. Okay, that's all you need to know about it. All right. 
So why do plants need to synthesize glucose? What is it used for in the next plant cells? I literally just sent this to you guys, but that's all right. You can take your picture for this and we'll head over to the lab next door. Apparently it's gonna be hot in there because it's hot in here. Thank you. 